What if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing the past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. And this is the healing technique that we've now been teaching it, well, since 2002, that's 12 years. What if you could time travel with them? Visit mythical places or angelic realms, other worlds, other galaxies. Help others to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT and now you can learn her method by going directly to DoloresCannon.com and don't forget to mention the discount code MORETALKS. The next speaker is our, one of our new authors. We have just published her book and was mm -hmm. one that Toward the end there, we were really rushing to get a lot of these books here in time for the conference. Believe me, that wasn't easy. And yours just came off the press. Yes, hot off the press. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sherry O'Brien, <clears throat> and her book is Peaks and Valleys. I said before, all of these authors' books are available in the vendor area at our table. And Sherry will be doing a book signing afterwards. Mm -hmm. We have a half an hour break between. Yep. So Sherry O'Brien with Peaks and Valleys. I'm not going to give her bio because she'll be talking about it and it's in the program. Okay. Thanks, Take Dolores. Hello, everyone. Well, it's refreshing to be here uh, with this crowd because uh, as I was telling Dolores, I'm used to presenting to an educational conference with professionals looking for CEUs. And as a result of that, I have to provide oh, research. And, and as far as I'm concerned, I know what I do works, and I don't particularly like having to show all the research of why it works. But in order to uh, satisfy continuing education credits, that's one of the things I have to do. So here, I'll mention a little bit about some of the research, but we're going to dive into what I do, why I do it, and we'll do a, a little experiential here. Now, I'll do a post-workshop on Monday where we'll actually delve into the techniques that I'm going to be talking about and uh, in a lot more detail than I can do here today. So um, just while people are still walking in, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and how I uh, got into this field and how the book came to be. The reason I actually wrote this book in the beginning was for my own healing. And what I mean by that is I had been working with cancer patients and I'd been working and doing a bereavement group and I had been doing a lot of uh, work with my clients in, in my private practice, and I noticed a lot of grief and loss issues. However, it wasn't until my own family endured some devastating losses that I realized there wasn't a whole lot out there to help people beyond talk. There were support groups, there were bereavement support groups, but there were, it, it just didn't get into the really heart of the matter. So, when my nephew died, um, it's been about five and a half years ago, of cancer, bladder cancer, at the age of 21, and I walked that journey with my sister and literally walked into the room um, when, at, right after he had died, and I witnessed my sister's spirit wanting to leave her body and go with him. I started doing some of the techniques on her to keep her 
present. And I'm the oldest, and I felt uh, the therapist in me wanted to fix it, the big sister in me wanted to protect her, and I was also grieving the loss of my nephew. We were very close. So I did some of the energy work with her, and then we're going to flash forward a little bit. Six months later, my brother committed suicide. Now, I had been working with him off and on, uh, doing a variety of different techniques, and um, the therapist in me was trying to help him get the help he needed in the mental health community. But what I was aware of was, um, and I, I know this crowd will understand what I'm talking about, there was an attachment um, to his energetic field that I couldn't get rid of. I, and I, I did some more studying and, and uh, looked into that after he had uh, committed suicide. So all the time that I'm going through this process, what I realized was as I reached out for help, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot out there to help me get rid of the physical energy of the loss and, and the grief that I was carrying around with me. Now, I'm going to talk about vibrations for a moment. Everything that's in existence is a vibration. The energy of grief and loss is a heavy, heavy vibration. Depending on the type of loss that you endure, the heavier and the slower the vibration is. So what I realized when I looked at from an energetic standpoint and the, the energy psychology work and the energy medicine work and all of the other dynamics that I had uh, been using with my private practice clients was that was missing in the field of grief and loss. Now, obviously, the most devastating is the loss of a loved one. And by that, I, I mean I want to uh, clarify, a loved one can be a pet. It can be an animal. I mean, I've lost some dogs and cats, and, and it was devastating to me. So kind of like what Ron had talked about earlier, um, there can be trauma endured in, in any kind of a loss. Now, from a professional standpoint, I would often hear professionals refer to, and I hate this term, but I'm just going to say it, um, they would call it little T's and big T's. Little T's were the traumas that were not classified in this manual that mental health professionals use as con, um, criteria that, would, that need to be met to be a trauma. The big T's are anybody, you know, you think about going through a catastrophic illness or a war or anything like that, that qualified as the big T. When I started working with people, I realized, you know, trauma is in the eye of the beholder. If you feel traumatized and somebody says, oh, well, that's a little T, how's that helpful? You're still holding it in your body. So trauma is in the eye of the beholder, and there's a whole chapter that I talk about in my book about that. So what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about why it's important for us to recognize how any kind of loss, now when I say any kind of loss, Going back to working with my clients, people would come in and they retired, for example. I'll talk about a, a gentleman that I'd worked with. He had retired. He had been in, um, he had did crisis work. He was a, 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 I don't know what they call him here, emergency medical um, person. And he, so he went out to, you know, any kind of a crisis incident through the, with the fire department. So when he retired, he, you know, like all of us, we plan our financial piece of retirement, but we don't, re we don't <laughs> plan for how we're going to see ourselves after we retire, our identity. So he had lost his self-identity. He had lost something that he had done day in and day out that gave him a sense of meaning and purpose. And also, um, you know, the, the rush and the passion of helping assist people and, and, you know, basically keeping a person alive or being with them when they died, he had lost all of that. So when we did some work around the loss, 
that he endured as a result of retirement, he was able to move forward, acquire a different role, re-identify himself, find another passion, but he couldn't do that until we got rid of the, um, the block that I'm going to call the energetic block of loss. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that in, in just a little bit more about that in just a moment. What I did was I pulled together a dictionary definition of, of loss. And as you can see, dictionary definition talks a little bit about the harm or suffering caused by losing or being lost. This is the second definition is the one that I'm going to talk about today. The power decrease in a circuit, circuit element or device caused by resistance. Now, energetically, anything we have an attachment to, we resist losing. So if we have an attachment to a job, if we have an attachment to a person, if we have an attachment to uh, a, a particular routine or habit, and then we no longer have that, we're going to resist that. And there's, we're going to, as a result of resisting, we're going to incur a loss. Now, what I want to say is this, what I'm using here today is broad and general for, for the sake of explanation. This doesn't happen to everyone. It's not all inclusive. But what I want you to understand is you, when you think about it from those terms, then you can see how energetically we resist any change. I mean, anybody in here resist change? Yeah. It's, it's one of those things that we humans, we love our routines, we love our, how we identify with things. I, Ron had talked a little bit about how as when we grow up, we acquire a certain personality type. Um, some people would refer to that as ego. We are set in our perceptions of reality. And our perceptions of reality sometimes can be flawed. So when we work with the resistance or the block energetically that, that, incur, when we, excuse me, that we incur as a result of a loss, then we can help people move forward in a healthy way. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment and some of the techniques that I use to help people with this. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list, but here are some of the types of losses that you may recognize and some of the others you may not recognize. Death of a loved one, I put that number one. That's probably the most extreme and difficult loss that we have. Relationships, mobility, and abilities. When I work with the cancer patients, I had a gentleman who was diagnosed with breast cancer, and uh, that in and of itself was a rude awakening to a, here he was, a man diagnosed with breast cancer. So his self-identity was already compromised. But then he also was, he loved shooting guns, he liked going out and doing target practice, he loved riding his sickle, and as he started deteriorating from the chemo and the surgery and the radiation, he no longer could shoot his guns, he couldn't shoot, he, he, he couldn't ride his sickle, he couldn't carry a bag of salt down to his water softener, and he felt less of a man as a result of it. So mobility and abilities have to be grieved, and we can do that on a way that it's not that you forget the memory, but you, the, the disruption in the energy field is cleared in some of the work that I'm going to show you here today. Status, lifestyle, jobs, home. The one I want to really talk about today because of the time is uh, divine homesickness, and the next one we're going to call genetic or ancestral grief. So, before, we, before I get started to move further, um, I'm very empathic and intuitive, and I know it's after lunch, and I can feel the energy going down really slowly now. So, <laughs> I'm going to ask you, I've trained with Donna Eden, and she's one of the endorsers of my book, and she's got some lovely re-energizing exercises. So, I'm going to have you get up, I know this is just, you know, uncalled, unheard of in, in a conference, but we're going to do this because I want you awake. <laughs> 
Plus, I was pushing number one. Whoops. I was pushing number one, and I was on number one, and I decided, you know, I probably need to do these exercises too. <laughs> so I want you to rub your hands together and just shake them off. And then put your hands on your thighs and step about shoulder length apart. And then you're going to take a nice deep breath. Now, Ron talked about breath today, so you're going to take a nice deep breath. And I want you to imagine as you breathe in, you're gathering up all the energy around you. So take a nice deep breath, gather it in, just circle your arms up, then bring it down into a prayer position. Okay, now we're going to do that one more time. Shake it off, put your legs together, or excuse me, hands on your legs. Curl it up, gather up all that energy, bring it down. Now, you're going to face one side, it doesn't matter when. You're going to put your hand up, and just for sec sake of explanation, put your right hand up, turn your head to the right. It looks like you look like an Egyptian when you do this, so do the Egyptian pose. Stretch, and then tr with your left hand, you're going to try to touch the ground. And then you're going to come back up to the prayer position. And you're going to do the same thing on the other side. Now this gets the, what she calls the radiant circuits moving. This gets the energy moving in the bones because you're expanding. You can do this if you can't stand up. You can do it sitting down. You're just going to stretch. Prayer pose. Stretch other side. Prayer pose. Now, sometimes, but I know because of the table in front of you, it's going to be hard to do. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll have people bend over and do the figure eights. You're, com you're combining that. You can't do it here because of the space, but you can certainly do the fi figure eights. And you're just gathering up all the energy in your biofield. Oh, by the way, now that science can prove that we have an aura, it is called biofield. I, you know, I love that because now that science can show things, they have to come up with their own terminology for it. Okay, now just shake it off. Have you ever noticed how when animals get up or if, if they've ran away from a threat, they shake? Nobody ask you to do that now. Just shake. I don't know why when we became you know, less primitive, uh, we stopped doing the very things that help us. So do it one more time. Hey, I'm up here in front of everybody, so. <laughs> All right, now go ahead and have a seat. Now, hopefully you feel a little bit more awake. So one of the reasons why I wanted you to wake up during this is because these two, um, they, they may be a little foreign to you. So as you get back in your body, and sometimes we do tend to disassociate when we're tired, uh, this will make a little bit more sense to you, especially divine homesickness. So I put this um, poem together, or actually Susan Jeffers did, but this poem is in the book, um, and it's when we are constantly focused on externals, what's going on out there, we are not centered. That is, we are not aligned internally, body, mind, and spirit. Without that alignment, we have a case of divine homesickness. So when we feel we cannot connect or align with source, we feel a sense of disconnection. And that's when we can get into this divine homesickness. We feel empty and lost, always trying to find our way home always looking for something out there to fill us up and nothing out there can. Now, I don't know if any of you have went down this journey where you're looking for something to fill you up. You're looking for knowledge. You're looking for that next technique. You're looking, looking, looking. I know I was. And I always felt like I had a hard time fitting in. I never felt like I fit in. Um, I'm from Indiana, and... Um, some of the stuff that I was doing would be considered woo-woo. Even my own husband called me woo-woo. But then I, you know, he would be hurting or something, and he'd say, come do that voodoo, woo-woo, whatever you call it, stuff on me. 
<laughs> and, you know, it's interesting. What I've seen as, as, as Indiana has developed and, and the population that I worked with developed, more, and pe more people understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about not feeling like fitting in. Now, I, I, I get it that I've got a biased population because they come to me because they know I do energy work. They come to me because of the type of work that I do, referrals, etc. And so as a result of being just a little open, oftentimes they don't feel like they fit in with that population that they used to fit in with. They're growing, they've matured, they're outgrowing. They're starting to recognize that something else is out there, but they're not sure what. So they feel lost. Now, divine homesickness, I define it as a profound sense of loss from connection of the divine. Often it seems too difficult, to life seems too difficult to deal with. And we have a deep longing to return to the spirit world. Now, I'm not talking about suicidal, although I've seen people become suicidal as a result of this, especially if we can't help them understand that their connection is only broken by their own unwillingness to reconnect. And oftentimes, going back to energy psychology, one of, that, one of the reasons why people feel like they can't reconnect to source is one, source doesn't fit into that paradigm that they were taught growing up. And as a result, they've disconnected because it didn't, how they believed the source or um, God or the divine, whatever you want to call it, didn't fit into that paradigm, then they felt lost as a result of it. And so they pulled away and disconnected. I, I went through that very similar incident a long time ago, but I also went through it when I was going through this loss of my nephew and my brother. And um, later on, we're going to do a, a brief excerpt of a meditation that I call my divine download because I went into a meditative state and uh, this information came through to me. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But when I work with people with divine homesickness, and you may notice it too, either among those that you, uh, it, it may be yourself, or maybe those that, your circles, people will disassociate oftentimes. And what I mean, I don't mean the extreme disassociation that used to be referred to as multiple personality. What I mean is you'll see people just check out. Their attention isn't there. You may be talking to them and you're like having this conversation and they went somewhere else. And sometimes, usually, when you're having a conversation that has a lot of meaning to them, but they can't hear yet because they don't have the, um, the tools to integrate it, into their paradigm, their perception of reality. So has, I'm going to guess, a few of you might have seen What the Bleep Do We Know? I mean, it's an old film out there, wonderful, yeah. And it was wonderful how they showed how our perception of reality can be wrong. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> so. The same thing happens, especially when we've endured a loss. You're going to have a memory, you're going to have an experience, and you're going to keep, oftentimes if it includes trauma, you may keep going over and over and over trying to change that memory, trying to give you a sense of control over something that you felt like you had no control over then, and your whole reality is skewed. And you may say, you may tell the story to somebody else that may have been a witness to that, and they may say, no, it didn't really happen that way. In your mind, it happened that way. And in your mind is where the um, disruption occurs or the block occurs. So I work with people on the, with these techniques, the one, and I um, share these techniques in my book to help people reconnect to the divine, help them recreate their perception of reality. Now, I, I will say divine homesickness can also be, I've worked with people, I also do hypnotherapy, although it's not Dolores' type. Um, I've seen people, we call them star people, seed people, they, they've, they've basically come, this is the first visit to earth, so to speak, 
and they've come from other uh, venues, planets, whatever you want to call it, dimensions. There's so many different ways of explaining this. They also get a sense of divine homesickness. They want to go back home. It, this earth school is too challenging for them and they feel disconnected. So when I work with helping people reconnect with some of the tools that I've shared in my book, and, and we'll do some exercises here today, then they can feel reconnected in a way that they can pull from that source energy wherever the source is, okay? Next, what I wanna talk about. Now, this is interesting because I've, I've seen this happen for years and years and years, but Science now can prove something called epigenetics. Bruce Lipton and Dawson Church are um, the two probably most popular researchers that have written books, Biology of Belief, and um, Dawson Church wrote um, The Genie in Our Genes. Now they can prove that this exists. <laughs> when, you know, again, you probably, if you're like me, kind of knew it anyway. Ancestral grief. Now, this can be past life issues as well, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it from a genetic standpoint first. Ancestral grief can come when whole communities grieve, such as the American Indians, African American, Jewish commu communities, when there was mass trauma that occurred and that trauma wasn't resolved because, you know, people had to live, they had to survive. The last thing they could do is go to a therapist and have their trauma resolved. They had to survive, so they froze it. That fight, flight, freeze, they actually froze it genetically in their genes and passed it along. So I had a woman who came in, and she was um, definitely in the grief cycle, but she couldn't understand. She hadn't had any significant loss, and she couldn't understand what was going on. We did a regression, and she went back to this American Indian. Um, her whole tribe was slaughtered, and her ancestrals uh, had carried that grief for many, many, many years. And we went back, we did um, some of the techniques that I um, share in my book, we went back and literally changed it in her genes so that she could release the grief that she had been carrying. So what I mean by that is when, now I want you to think about it. If you've been in, endured any kind of a shock, what's the first thing you do? You take a breath <laughs> and you hold it. When you hold that breath, you're holding it in your heart chakra, you're holding it in your lung meridian, you're literally stuffing it within, and then it reverberates down to a gene level, down to your genes. And unless that's released, literally science now is showing that male sperm can be a carrier of trauma, grief, any kind of emotion that wasn't resolved. But I also believe from a, um, because I've done so much work, um, the woman's egg. But here's the other thing. I didn't know this at the time until I started getting into this. Believe me, I started, I, I was kicking and screaming because I didn't want to um, specialize in helping people with grief and loss. It's not something I, said, oh boy, I want to grow up and be a, you know, therapist and help people with grief and loss. But I was set up for it divinely in some ways. When my uh, mother was pregnant with me, her father died. My, my grandfather died in March, and I was born in November of the same year. I had genetically taken on my mother's grief and didn't realize it. So I was holding that for a long period of time. And when it was re-triggered by those losses that I mentioned earlier of my nephew and my brother, it was so out of proportion. I mean, those were extreme cases anyway, but it was so out of proportion that it literally became paralyzing to me. Then I went in and did some of this work that I'm going to share with you today, and I'll go in deeper in the workshop. So I had to get rid of it from a genetic standpoint. So I helped not only myself, but 
generations to come because energy is non-local and it rippled into various generations. Do you all understand what I mean by that? All right, so as we look at this from that standpoint, we can help people release the energetic blocks using some of the techniques like energy psychology, hypnotherapy, energy medicine, healing rituals, and so forth that I've listed all in my book. And we can pave the way for increasing the vibration and therefore increasing the results of um, the healing and recovery. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, when I uh, do an exercise here in just a moment. But first, I want to break the stages of grief myth. How many are aware of this model? Almost, okay. Unfortunately, Kubler Ross did work with the terminally ill. So those stages were not really applicable to the bereaved. They were, it was, we didn't have any really good models at that time, so they were adapted to the bereaved. But if anybody has tried to fit into this, I mean, a lot of times people would go into the denial and the anger, the bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Some people could, I'd have people come into my bereavement groups and they'd go, you know, I'm still in anger. When am I ever going to get to acceptance? <laughs> they would literally go into this and, you know, it's been six months. Shouldn't I be somewhere other than where I'm at? And they would talk about time limits. They would talk about staging. And this I didn't feel, and I still don't feel, is an accurate assessment of someone's grief. Now, you can, you can superimpose this on the model that I use, and it... I think works much better. The grief cycle, now I've listed the various phases here, but this is not a stage process and I'll show you in just a moment. Grief cycle involves shock. So remember what I said, when you first lose anything, a loved one, a job, a relationship, you take that deep breath, you hold it, it's a shock. Then you go into protest. Why me? Why now? Why them? Trying to find meaning in the loss so that hopefully your humanness believes you can prevent it from ever happening again. If you can find meaning, if you can find out why, then you can prevent it from happening again. And then you go into what's considered the disorganization phase. Now, do you remember when I talked about earlier how we humans love routine and habits? And whenever that's shattered, we have a loss, just a secondary loss, in and of itself of because now I'm no longer having dinner with my loved one every Thursday night. I had a woman who had come in three years after her husband died, and uh, every Thursday night they'd have a cookout, and on Thursdays she had to go out of the house because every Thursday night she started feeling that loss all over again. So she, her, her routine, her habits on Thursday nights were disorg. I mean, they were just sh shattered because of the loss of her husband. But that can happen with a job, if you think about it. If you lose a job, you no longer get up at whatever time you got up to go to work or go to bed a certain time. Your routine and habits change. So there's this disorganization. Your roles change. So when you lose a spouse, does that mean you're no longer a husband or wife? Because you feel like it. You know, it's one of those things that people still are, are having um, difficulties understanding that's never had a loss. They'll, they'll give you helpful advice on, oh, uh, you just need to get over it. That's like telling a person they shouldn't feel a certain way. How, I mean, anybody be, has anybody in here been told, oh, you shouldn't feel that way? Was it helpful? No, of course not, because you cannot not feel the way you're feeling. So then you get into a double bind because <laughs> somebody told you you shouldn't feel a certain way, but you do feel that way, and, and then you go into this inner critic thing. So when you're in this disorganization phase, you're trying to find a way of making sense of what happened, re-identifying with who you are apart from what you've lost, 
creating new roles, creating new habits, routines, et cetera. And then you go into, once you get that, you go into that reorganization phase. You've developed new healthy habits. You've de maybe developed a new role, an identity. You're moving in the direction of recovery. And recovery, in the model I use, this is how I use it, because as long as you are moving, you're moving from shock, protest, disorganization, reorganization, as long as there's movement in this cycle, you are in recovery. So people no longer come to me saying, well, when, you know, it's been six months, when am I going to get into the recovery phase or stage? Because as long as you're moving through this cycle, you are in recovery. That's what recovery is. And you may, people who have lost loved ones, they may hear a song or something may come up that will put them back into a shock and they'll go through this all over again. Now, when I was writing my book, um, the story of the loss and, and going into detail with the loss of my nephew, I was, I was having a really hard time and I was becoming very tearful and the emotions were flowing and I went out on my balcony and I'll tell, I tell this story and I'm just going to summarize it here, but I went out on the balcony trying to write. That's my little sanctuary, if you will. And what I found was I was just paralyzed and all of a sudden this butterfly comes down and lands on the page. Now the butterfly represented my nephew because I did a butterfly release a year before that in his memory. And this was the exact kind of butterfly. If you've ever done a butterfly release, which I'll t I talk about in my ritual section of my book, the poor butterflies are dormant for a few minutes. So they come out of this little envelope and they just kind of sit there until they get their bearings again. And I got to know the, the color and, and I got to know this butterfly a little bit more than you would a, a regular natural butterfly. And it was the exact same color and the exact same kind that landed on the page that I was writing on or trying to write on. So I had a conversation with my nephew because it represented him. It was, a, it was very symbolic. And I'm sure that if any of you have lost a loved one, you have symbols that they're still with you in, in whatever way you can connect with them. And the symbols are just another reinforcer of that. So I, I, you know, had this conversation with this butterfly and um, was very thankful and basically started writing again. And the butterfly takes off and another one comes and they join together and they're, and they're playing. To me, that represented he's not alone and he's, he's playing. He's having a good time. I'm the one that's having a hard time about this. He, on the other hand, has transitioned. And that helped me get through that whole piece. But I went into this whole cycle again for just a moment. It's brief, it's intermittent, the frequency was less, the intensity was less, but I went through the whole, the shock, the protest, the disorganization, the reorganization, just for a moment until it was released. Okay, so I wanna say something here before uh, we go into an exercise. This is how trauma happens. And again, remember, it's all in the eye of the beholder. The amygdala in the brain becomes overcharged. So something happens and the amygdala can get overcharged. Now, this differs with everyone. What causes trauma for one person may not cause trauma for another. So what may be a traumatic loss for another person may not be perceived, remember, perception of reality, as traumatic for someone else. So when the amygdala becomes overcharged, the hippocampus in the brain just gets disabled. It's like it goes dormant. The hippocampus in the brain is about, this happened today, this happened three years ago, this happened 10 years ago. When it becomes disabled, that's the flashbacks. And those flashbacks feel like they're happening right now. And people can tell you to get over it. It's not happening. It's not going to do anything because that chemical cascade, you're in that feedback loop, and until you discharge it, you're, you, the likelihood of that feedback loop continuing is very, very good. So the techniques that I use and, and that I present in my book involve that releasing, helping the amygdala become more um, basically unactivated. 
the hippocampus become more aware of the time and being able to discharge that feedback loop. Now next, I want to say something really briefly, and we're going to do an exercise here. Heart math. Is anybody familiar with heart math in here? Another great thing. Research shows that the heart is more powerful than the brain. I kind of already knew that, because have you ever had that, you know, I just can't make sense of it. I feel it, but I can't make sense of it. Or you, your brain's telling you to do something else, but it doesn't feel right. That has been proven now by heart math. So we're going to do an exercise here in just a moment. I just wanted to put this up here, basically showing you that if you're in another person's proximity, your heart beat and the energy from your heart is resonated in the other person's brain waves. So you all are connected right now, and you didn't even know it, just because you're in the vicinity and proximity of each other's heart waves. Your brain waves are connected. Now, we're going to do a, a quick exercise. I'm going to talk about um, these more in my workshop, the, the meditations, the acupoint um, stimulation. Anybody familiar with emotional freedom technique? Okay. That is, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in just a moment, but for the sake of um, time here, I'm going to do a brief meditation. So if you have your cell phones on, please shut them off. And if they're on stun, please put them on silent so that you don't get taken out of this. So we're going to do this brief meditation. What this meditation is, this is an excerpt from my CD that I talked about being a divine download. When I was having a really difficult time and this energy of grief felt really heavy and I just couldn't shake it and I was very angry at God and I went in and I'm like, you know, what good is it? I got all these tools and I can't help myself or my family. This divine download came to me. Now, we're only going to have a chance to go into the heart, but it is the most, it is the strongest electromagnetic organ we have in the body. So I wanted to give you a little preview of this. And the rest of the meditation goes from the heart and spirals into every single chakra, and you release the energy. Um, but I don't have time to do it today. We'll do it in the post-workshop if you're going to attend that. And the CD is also available with my book in the bookstore. So please make sure your cell phones are off. And we're going to go ahead and, and get started. Now, there's a little introductory because this is an actual excerpt from the CD. So it'll tell you to get comfortable and turn off your First, cell phones. Find a comfortable place where you can relax. Can everybody hear it okay? Turn off your cell phones. Put the do not disturb sign out for others to see. This is your time. So just close your eyes. Give yourself at least 30 minutes Take of a couple of deep breaths. space. Get as comfortable as you can in those seats. Once you become familiar with this meditation, you can certainly modify it to meet your needs. For now, get into a comfortable position. Close your eyes and begin taking a few deep breaths. Now with your next inhalation, hold your breath for just a few seconds. As you exhale, begin to feel this wave of relaxation.
experience whatever image resonates within you. be holding on to any blame of yourself or another any shame this is your soul's divine essence Before the grief overshadowed this light existed, Take a couple of deep breaths. Bring your awareness back. Back to this time and place. Return to the room. Now, if I had more time, this, this whole meditation is in my book, and then again, there's the CD where I guide you through it. This meditation uses the power of not only uh, using your mind, but the energy of the chakras and uh, color. Color is a vibration. And the silvery white color is a color that connects you to source. And it helps with releasing any energetic burdens and going through in a spiral format. A spiral, if you think about it, kind of goes in and it comes out. And so it, it goes in, takes the energy out, and uh, it's individual for each person. So your experience is different um, each time you do it. And I've had a lot of my clients and people uh, tell me they fall asleep during the exercise, and I, you know, that's okay. At first, people will listen to it at night, and as they get rid of more and more layers, then they can be present. Now, I'm going to say something real quick. I, I've noticed I'm, I'm running a little low on time here, so I want to go over this real quick. In my workshop, we'll go into, we'll delve into the actual technique. Energy psychology is based upon stimulating and activating dif different acupoints and chakras of the body. That's what energy psychology is. And this is a, a, just a <clears throat> brief diagram, a short version of something called emotional freedom technique. And you stimulate each one of these acupoints while you're experiencing whatever emotion you're, you're experiencing. So grief is very complex in that you feel sad, you feel angry, you may have 
a sense of shock. You may have a sense of relief. A lot of my uh, bereavement folks will talk about being relieved after they've seen their loved one suffer for many years or months. There's a sense of relief. And then they feel guilty for feeling relief, and then they feel ashamed. And so we have to work on each one of those emotions. We do that by stimulating the acupoints or exercising the various chakras of the body. And what I mean by exercising is we go through using imagery or we'll go through and do... Actually, why don't you go ahead and do this? This would be really quick. Put your right hand on your heart center. Take a couple of deep breaths. Move your hand towards your little finger. So you're taking, you're just circulating your hand over your heart chakra, and any time you need to release something, so even though I'm feeling pressured for time right now because I didn't get through everything I want to talk about, <laughs> except this part of me. So any time you do this, again, this exercise is in my book, so there's a diagram and so forth in it. I also talk about various rituals. Rituals are very powerful and help us get through. And as we use each other to help support whatever it is you're going through, then you're going to find the energy of whatever it is you're doing, whatever um, ritual. So we have healing rituals that involve burning ceremonies, God boxes. We'll do a couple of those rituals in my post-workshop. We have um, remembering rituals. If you remember, I said I released a butterfly in memory of my nephew. You can do all kinds of different rituals for that. Redefining and rediscovering, going into and doing journaling, meditation, etc. to help with that. And um, also available with the purchase of my book is a free download of an MP3 that's a ritual in connecting with your inner critic. How many people have an inner critic? Anybody have an inner critic? I named mine Wicked Wanda. When Wicked Wanda visits me, I have to go into a meditative state and have some dialogue with her, and then we go back in and we do some work, and then she becomes my... Um, guide or guidance or goddess, whatever you want to call it. So this meditation will help you find your inner critic, not that any of you have any, and go in and tame that inner critic. And it is available free with the purchase of my book, which is now available at the conference bookstore. All right, I got two minutes left. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> so the book's going to help you triumph over tragedy, transform pain, mend a broken heart, recover from trauma, and move forward because you're releasing the energetic blocks that are held at a cellular level. Talk only goes so far, and the techniques that I have in my book will help you move forward. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> What if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves physically, emotionally, and spiritually? When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing the past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. And this is the healing technique that we've now been teaching it, well, since 2002, that's 12 years. What if you could time travel with them? Visit mythical places or angelic realms, other worlds, other galaxies. Help others to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT and now you can learn her method by going directly to DoloresCannon.com and don't forget to mention the discount code MORETALKS.